morning everyone and uh, thank you for joining us for our user group it's great to see you all virtually despite the fact that I can't actually see you guys um, but great that you're all here um, oh I can hear a bit of background noise so if everyone can make sure that they're on mute that would be wonderful um, okay, so I guess we will kick start with introducing our leaders. So Ella, do you want to go first? Yeah. Hi everybody, um, I'm Ella Wersdale. I've been um, supporting and running um, as one of the co-leaders of the Tableau Healthcare Use Group, I think for maybe four years, I can't actually remember time, uh, the last couple of years has been a bit strange isn't it um so up until last summer i worked in the nhs for 16 years and have been using tableau for about seven years um, i used to work for Pennine care and uh, successfully rolled out tableau and embedded it and, and i can honestly say that kind of tableau has had a massive impact on my career and i think it's um, a great technology and has shifted the way we can engage with people so um, a big advocate of tableau and data and everything and uh yeah i'm here to Hang out in the youth group. Thanks, Ella. Uh, Chris. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Chris Dixon. I was one of Tableau's first customers in the NHS back in 2010, I think it was. Um, I've since moved out of the NHS, but still very much interested in, in uh, helping and supporting uh, NHS and data. Um, I've only really been helping with the uh, user group since we went virtual really i think my first user group as a helper was virtual so um i've only known doing this through covid time so yeah nice to see you all thank you thanks chris um i'll introduce myself so hi guys i'm emma so i started using tableau when i first started in the nhs when i was working for nhs england i worked on a number of the um kind of national dashboards that you find um, I now work for Guys in St Thomas's, which unfortunately uses Power BI, so I'm really thankful to still be part of this user group so I can still uh, share some Tableau stuff because I'm not a massive fan of Power BI and uh, don't, don't do a very good job of hiding that at work. Um, I also worked for Tableau for two months during my crowd scheme, which was just a really great experience and something that's uh, led to a lot of my enthusiasm for mm -hmm. the use of Tableau and especially using it in the NHS to um, better our anal analytics and reporting. Um, and I'll pass over to Charlotte, our newest member of the team. Hi, I'm um, Charlotte Newsom. Well, I currently work for Pen and Care. Today is actually my last day at Pen and Care, but we will be starting with Greater Manchester Mental Health on Monday, which are both um, mental health trusts in the NHS in Greater Manchester. Um, I've been using Tableau for a couple of years now, and this is my first um, time supporting the youth group. So excited to be here, and good morning, everybody. Thanks, Charlotte, and welcome. Um, so outside of this user group, Tableau has a really, really great community. So if you don't already follow a number of these things, go and check them out. They're all really great ways of staying in touch with different people inside healthcare and outside healthcare um, and getting some really great ideas and inspiration. Um, so go check out those. Um, and Twitter and LinkedIn, also great ways to connect with other um, Tableau people. I think one of, the, one of the things that I love about Tableau that you don't get with anything else is the community behind it, it's the support, it's the passion. And you'll, you'll find all those people that can really help you out um, by following these sorts of things. Uh, bringing us on to the agenda. So we have just started and are coming to the end to the welcome and introductions. Uh, we will then have a session with Ella looking at relaunching Tableau. Then we'll head over to Mark, who's going to do a session on focusing on what matters. You'll then come back to me for a bit of a quiz. Hopefully I haven't made it too hard. And then we will hand over to David, who will look at what the new features in Tableau are. And then we'll go to Julia and Steve to do a CBD action plan session. And then we'll just finish off and say goodbye. Um, so to make sure that everyone has enough time, I'll now um, hand over to Ella to start the first session. 
Thank you very much. I'll seamlessly try and change my slides. Uh, while Ella does that, I'll just wanted to say to everyone, uh, uh, while the speakers are talking, I am keeping an eye on the chat. Uh, so if you do have any questions and you're worried about not remembering them for the end of the conversation <coughs> or the presentation, please put them in the chat and I will come back to you uh, at the end of each talk. Okay, let me just make sure I meet tech is what is hopefully I can share my screen now. So you should see a slide that says relaunching Tableau to give it a wow factor. Um, so um, I actually, and I'm trying to remember what year it was, but I was part of kind of launching Tableau at Pennine Care um, years ago. And I did um, come and present, I think it was the first time I'd presented at the healthcare use group. And I think it's around about 2018, sharing the story of how we'd, how I'd helped to kind of lead the implementation of Pennine Care. Um, and so it's kind of great coming back kind of four or five years later to kind of talk about kind of where we got to kind of down the line. Um, this is actually my final healthcare user group um, as a co as a leader alongside um, my colleagues. Um, I've stepped out of the healthcare world and no longer work in the NHS, so felt that it was kind of best time to kind of step away from the healthcare group. Still really passionate about the NHS and healthcare. Hopefully that from the outside, I can kind of um, share some of the great stuff I'm doing in my new role. But um, yes, my last one. So it's kind of nice to round off my first one and my last one sharing kind of the story of kind of where I got uh, Tableau to. So just um, a little bit more background about me. So as I mentioned, I previously was a head of information and, and worked at Pennine Care for about 16 years and went from analyst and to managing the department. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about the implementation, but I've got my desktop qualified associate. So actually know how to use Tableau as well as be able to kind of talk about it and lead on it. Um, I run um, two user groups. Well, after today, there'll only be one. Um, but I also run the Northwest Tableau user group, which has been going for about four or five years as well, which I'm very passionate about. And also a Tableau user group ambassador, which I'm really proud to be. Um, just a bit about Pennine Care in terms of the footprint they Citizens, so they cover the east of Manchester, about 1.3 million patient population. That's kind of 200 sites. It's community-based services as well as inpatient services. Um, there's learning disabilities in there. So there's a real uh, range of different types of services. So it's spread over loads of sites and we've got, uh, there's over 3,000 employees. So a big kind of remit that, uh, the, and the types of services that we cover at Pennine. Um, in terms of Tableau timeline, um, in 2014, I went to a conference um, and at that point really struggled to make sure that we had a kind of, we didn't have a BI tool or a data visualization tool in Pennine Care. And it was really difficult to get funding to support that because I guess at that point, not many other places had one. So we were kind of battling with lots of SSRS reporting and SQL data warehouse and sending lots of reports like uh, most of you will probably recognize in Excel on a monthly basis, which people then ripped apart and didn't trust the data generally. And it used to take hours and hours to produce it. Um, and it was just lots of numbers. Um, but I spotted Tableau and had a very brief um, demonstration of that at a conference in 2014 by uh, one of our presenters today, Steve Adams. And within 10 minutes, I kind of recognised the power that it would have and luckily got the opportunity to buy a few desktop licences to start trialling it out. Um, and that's when things really shifted for me in terms of recognising that that technology could really make a difference to the organisation and help people engage with data and be able to speed up our processes and lots of other things. So in 2015, I was fortunate enough to get some funding to um, for a pilot for Tableau server and some additional desktop licenses so we could um, roll out more dashboards. So we identified that older community services with about 50 managers, we could launch and replace lots of our standard manual reporting in Tableau for them. So over the course of a couple of months, I led on a pilot, sat out in services one day a week, really trying to understand exactly how they would use data. And we had a really successful pilot. We had amazing feedback. Um, there was a massive shift in kind of ownership of data and data quality and performance. And it was it was amazing. It kind of blew my mind that it was had that much of an impact in, in a really short space of time, which then led um, to a full-on implementation after a kind of lengthy process around um, 
getting funding and getting a business plan approved and a proposal, we then launched Tableau across the whole of the trust, um, I think roughly about 500 to 600 users at that point, um, and basically replaced all our manual reporting, <clears throat> which include financial data, um, instance data, a bit of HR and lots of activity and performance information. So by the summer of 2016, we'd got it launched across the business. Um, and from that point onwards, we just started to grow the number of dashboards we had, the, the, the intelligence, the data sets that were feeding through from our data warehouse, the number of users, the type of stuff, improving the kind of content. And it just grew and grew and grew. And we spent um, a good few years kind of embedding and supporting our users. We had regular kind of support sessions and uh, communications and training to make sure that people could use it. And we learned a lot. And as the kind of, I guess, quite a few other organizations were using it, kind of discovered the Tableau community. We learned so much kind of about what we've done. And then it got to a point where, I guess in 2021 or around that time, we started to realize that there's quite a few improvements that we need to base to be done on that, uh, on that learning that we've made over the years. And the content had grown so much that we felt that it was a good opportunity to do a bit of a revitalize and reshift and have a look at kind of where we were and what we needed to do. So we decided to embark on a massive improvement project and relaunch Tableau. And before the pre-launch, Tableau had become the main business intelligence tool for the, for the organization. We had lots of, we had over 400 active users. We had more, probably 600, 700 registered, but there was 400 actively using it on a daily, weekly basis. We'd, we'd managed to get over 400 dashboards with probably over a thousand views in there. So there was a lot of data, a lot of um, dashboards. Our skills were growing in the team in terms of our data visualization and our Tableau skills had grown um, and become really efficient and competent at kind of delivering what we've done so far. We had multiple systems feeding in. As I mentioned, we've got lots of different data sets and including financial, clinical and corporate. So we've got lots of clinical information in there and activity and performance, as well as um, the financial HR and instance. So a real kind of mixture of stuff and lots of integrated reports so we can really uh, demonstrate our performance from uh, different angles. And we'd influenced other areas of the NHS and social care to use Tableau, recognizing that it was a great tool and it was quick to pick up. Um, and we supported other organizations to embark on kind of their Tableau journey as well, which was really great to see because then it grew our network and grew our learning and had opportunities to share what we're doing and learning from others as well. So it was really good. So that's kind of where we were ahead of kind of relaunching in 2021. Um, and Tableau within Pennine Care at that time, and still is, is used in lots of different ways. So it's used for assurance reporting. We'll use, um, they use dashboards up to board and producing kind of board reporting and performance reporting at all different levels. It's used for situation reporting. One of the great things um, that we were able to do during COVID is quickly um, pull together some dashboards based on data we're collecting around our COVID situation about our staff and about our patients. And so it started to be used absolutely as an operational tool on a daily basis and was a, was a godsend during COVID when we had to react to the number of requests that you can, um, you're all so all probably aware of and involved in. Um, also a management tool, so staff uh, managers will be able to log on and see what was going on for their staff from a HR point of view, from a performance point of view, from learning, um, all that kind of stuff. And also used as an analytic tool to do inside intelligence, so really kind of exploratory analysis. So we're using it from lots of different angles to really maximise the use of Tableau as a core tool that we used. Um, the outcome over the years um, at that point was that data quality had improved, ownership of performance and data quality had improved. We were no longer the corporate services responsible for all the problems with the data. Um, services started to roll in that because they could get into the data and drill right down to it. Confidence in the department and in the data and in Tableau in the way that we produce reports definitely built. So there's kind of a lot less mistrust than there was um, back in the day when they're producing lots of Excel reports. Um, we got additional funding. I was able to grow the team on the back of the success and the recognition that data could really make a difference in the, in the organization and got quite a bit of um, funding to be able to grow the team and grow the skills, which is really good. We've really started to make an impact on data literacy in terms of making sure that people could read and understand the data um, as our users and the data culture had shift. So I guess probably in 2014, 15, not many people would talk about data or if they did, they um, probably 
be uh, judging it in a very different way or mistrusting it or trying to work out what it was actually telling them. But they shifted. So I'd go to a lot of meetings, especially in the last couple of years of being at Pennine, where they'd be like, oh, we need to look at Tableau. And it wouldn't be me actually saying it. It'd be the, the managers, the directors who were like, right, we need some data to back up this or we need that. And it was just real shift in the, the language that was used around data um, during, I guess, then five years that we kind of grown it. But we recognised that there was improvements that was needed. Things weren't perfect. There was still loads of um, area for making it better. Um, and a lot of that was... It was a mixture of things. So one of the challenges were around the technology. So we were on a really old version of Tableau at that point. We'd missed kind of an, um, the opportunity to kind of upgrade a couple of years ago due to the challenges around um, the way that Tableau upgraded. So we needed to kind of upgrade our desktops and our servers and stuff and get um, some extra support. But due to kind of capacity and challenges from an IT side, from our sides, it meant that we were kind of slight, we were kind of far behind in terms of all the kind of new features of Tableau that would made our lives so much easier and made the the platform more engaging so we wanted to tackle that the demand had grown beyond all <coughs> recognition it was no I could never have pictured that when we were rolling out Tableau in 2016 I couldn't have imagined the demand we would get three or four down uh, three or four years down the line it was huge and we were trying to keep on top of that and it was coming from lots of different angles we had gaps in our content so when we first rolled it out I guess what we'd planned is to kind of our first kind of stab was trying to remove all our manual reporting and meet all the demand of our current users, but our user base changed and the structure of our, our organization changed and the way that the managers were changed. And actually we didn't really have board to ward or board to team reporting. It didn't kind of drill down at every level. So we knew there was some con content gaps which would help performance. Um, what our users said <clears throat> as, the, as the platform grew was that they really struggled to find content. So we'd gone from like rolling out 20 dashboards and they could find everything they needed because there wasn't much there to 400 dashboards because the amount of data that we had and the amount of demand had grown, whereas people started to get a bit lost in Tableau because there was so much. And especially new starters would come in and be like, well, what should I be looking at? And we'd be like, well, there's lots of stuff you could use. Um, so there was loads of feedback about how easy it was to navigate around, how easy it was to use the dashboards or not easy. And um, so lots of feedback that we've got over the kind of previous year to kind of work out what we needed to do. And engagement was mixed. So whilst we had lots of team managers and lots of people at certain levels of, of the, of the organisation accessing it, we didn't necessarily have really senior people accessing Tableau, which we felt was a challenge because they would be asking other people for data, would still be manually pulling stuff out of Tableau and taking screenshots and then serving it up by email to some of our senior management. So we wanted our execs and our directors to be accessing and using Tableau self-service. All the questions they want answering quickly, they could have got it themselves. We really wanted to work out how we got every level of the organisation engaged and using self-service and making sure that the data was kind of, um, the data knowledge was all the way up um, to different levels of the business. So, we embarked on an improvement plan and I split this into four pillars to make it really uh, clear about what we were trying to achieve. So when we went to talk to people about that, we're going to make improvements, but we need some capacity to do that. We need to kind of, you need to recognize that we might be pushing back on certain requests because we want to make improvement because it will make a big impact. So I wanted to break this down in, I suppose, four kind of easy pillars to work on. So it wasn't just about kind of looking at the way that the dashboards looked. It wasn't just about the technology and the infrastructure. It was about the whole thing that we wanted to think about in terms of data culture. So looking at the technology and the governance, making sure that the technology was fit for purpose. As I mentioned, we were on a quite old version and missing out on lots of opportunities to um lots of new features and lots of things that had happened in Tableau that we wanted to, to get out of and making sure the infrastructure underneath and the server base was good enough. We wanted to make sure the platform was accessible so they could find things. They knew what they were looking at and they could come on and, and a new starter would easily be able to find the content they wanted. So we wanted to make it really accessible. We wanted to make it intuitive. We wanted to make sure our dashboards and the content was really intuitive so we didn't need loads of training. We wanted to make sure we were maintaining it. So as I mentioned, we'd, the demand had got so huge and we were just churning stuff out and actually we've got a lot of content that probably needed to be archived or improved so we wanted to make sure we put in some new process about monitoring and maintaining it and keeping it uh, where it needed to be um, and we needed to review whether there's some better kind of I guess data security mechanisms or what we could kind of look at permission based um, access so when people logged in they just saw their little bit of the data rather than all the other stuff that they had to filter out 
So that was the kind of technology and governance that we wanted to look at. We wanted to make sure our dashboards and our analysis were fit for purpose and doing what they needed to. So we wanted to make sure they're efficient. So reducing that time to insights so when people again logged on to our dashboards, they weren't going, what am I looking at? That we made sure that the way that we built stuff was really intuitive. When we'd learned so much over the last four or five years of having Tableau in place and learned so much from the Tableau community and from all the training that we've had and the support and the ideas that we knew that some of our dashboards weren't as efficient. So we wanted to kind of revisit the way that we dished up our dashboards and made sure they were as efficient as possible for our users. We wanted to make sure they were easy to use and accessible. We wanted to make sure they were relevant so that there wasn't all this sea of stuff and people knew if they were this certain manager on this role that this is the type of dashboards they need to so making sure it's not just a dashboard for everybody is actually thinking about the roles and we wanted to increase the way that we co-design and collaborated with our users to make sure that they were engaged and that they felt that the products were theirs that they actually owned it so thinking about kind of product owners and saying this dashboard is is yours you kind of liaise with stakeholders and grow it before we kind of like just took requirements and then added bits to this dashboard and a bit to that because that's what some people were saying but actually then they're becoming they had too many filters or too many charts and things like that so we really wanted to go into a kind of collaborative co-design process that was a bit more strict really wanted to think about skills too so whilst the team still developed over the five years had a lot of kind of movement in the team so I really wanted to focus on making sure the analyst um skills were were growing in line with the maturity of the, the data maturity as that grew also thinking about the consumers and making sure their data literacy and their data skills and digital skills even were growing and that we were supporting our consumers to access the dashboards so that was really important so not just our analysts but also our users and also making sure that there was a role-based framework so that we understood well, what is the role of each person in the in the organization what sh how should they be using data what reports should they be looking at on a regular basis what is the expectation and then making them kind of making sure people were understood that in this job this is your expectation when it comes to data and tableau and things so really thinking about skills in its entirety and then i really wanted to look at kind of engagement as well so as i mentioned there was certain there was lots of people accessing it 400 people which is um, quite a large user base out of the number of managers we had in pen and care but there were certain pockets of the of the organization and certain levels of the organization that weren't engaging and we wanted to look at whether there was different ways of approaching that so we wanted to create a community make sure there was a real kind of buzz around tableau and data and really kind of growing it so a bit like creating a mini kind of data family in the, in the tableau community that's outside of our organization and business and that buzz and creating that within the within the organization we recognised that we needed to improve our communication and start to communicate regularly about new features or new dashboards and or kind of top tips and things like that. So we wanted to improve our communication and we wanted to make sure there was a better user support uh, mechanism in place as well. So just going into exactly what we did. Um, so from a technology and governance point of view, we upgraded, simple, <laughs> took a bit of time because of the desktops and the servers and stuff, we upgraded from version 10.4 to 2020.4, which was just before we were kind of going live. So a really, there was a big kind of jump in features. So we needed to kind of retrain our staff to make sure they could um, utilize all these features. But there was loads of quick wins that came from the back of the features that had been delivered in that couple, that space for a couple of years. That was so that was um, quite exciting for us to kind of, it's kind of like getting a new toy with lots of new features in it. We implemented a Tableau portal. So we um, purchased Interworks Curator to act as our landing page. So we did a lot of work looking at how to make Tableau more accessible. So we decided to have kind of a web kind of front end and Interworks Curator was a really good way of doing that. So we could brand it, we could make it more like a website. We could make the accessibility a lot easier for people to navigate around. So that was kind of putting an extra kind of layer on top of it. And that really helps people to engage. We implemented a, uh, an improved and developed a better kind of review and quality assurance process so that when we were building dashboards that we were putting in extra kind of measures to make sure that we're meeting the new standards that we had in place. We had a new permission model on certain reports so that we had like managers dashboards so when you logged in you would just see your staff and um, but really kind of using some dynamic permissions as well, so that was um, great I think we also gave people access to metadata so. Obviously, there's lots of stuff going on in our data warehouse, stitching all these data sets together and people would say, oh, the data's wrong and I shouldn't be seeing this team and that team doesn't link to that service area or whatever. 
but we actually then decided, well, let's dish up the metadata that's linking all that and the governance data that's linking this together and make that available through the front end of our new portal so that they can manage it. And that would be on one of the tabs that they would see. And we would ask them to manage it and highlight any issues because obviously there's so much movement in, in an organization that we can't always maintain that. So we gave the control back to our users and gave them access to everything that was going on underneath. So they understood that there's a lot more that happens than just Tableau and Tableau might not be wrong. It's just some of the stuff that they need to help us maintain. So there's lots around kind of governance as well that we did. Um, in terms of dashboards and analysis, we developed a new pro forma. So we um, developed a pro forma that helped us collect the requirements in a better way. So we understood exactly the kind of dashboards that we were looking at, what level it was at, what, who else we could use it, what was kind of the audience base, what was the user story behind it, and what was the benefit. So again, in terms of that demand that had been growing over the years, we wanted to put in a better kind of impact analysis to make sure we were prioritising the right kind of dashboards and analysis and what value we're going to get on the back of it so we can really help to prioritize. So we came up with a, a new way of kind of collecting that information and engaging with our users and making sure it fit into kind of our new structures within Tableau. So a new kind of pro, pro forma to help, help the analysts and help um, our managers in the team really engage with our users and manage our demand. Um, we've got, we had developed a, a style guide, which um, Interwork supported with. So we basically came up with a whole new kind of look and feel for our dashboards to help with that um, standardization but also making them far more professional learning all the stuff that we'd learned over the last few years we we just wanted to kind of I guess pimp them up a bit but make them really slick and make them more accessible and utilize some of the extra features so we have a style guide that helped um, us to rebuild some of our dashboards and make them look um, a, lot, a lot different and a lot better we created new leadership dashboards so dashboards at different levels of the business. So again, trying to make sure that there was ones for the execs as well as different levels and also some managers dashboards so that again, they could use Tableau for lots more stuff and started to look at product owners. So we got our users to own some of the products we were creating so that then they were in charge of how it would evolve and change. So there was loads of new content and things looked um, better than they've ever done before. In terms of the skills element and that pillar, we developed a couple of things. So we developed a framework um, for our analysts to kind of progress through to make sure they kind of grew from rookie to professional. There was no necessary expectation they had to get to professional level, but really kind of taken through a structure. So created a, a created a kind of development um, framework that they could work through for each levels, which would get them some badges. So they could become a data wrangler or a data rock star or a tabla rock star. They could also put um, some of these on the bottom of their emails so that people knew who was who was behind Tableau and, and these analysts that were building stuff. And um, so we built this framework to give them milestones to work through some initiatives. And it was based on, um, if people have seen, but Fee Gordon. Um, oh, no, I've got a question. One more thing, just get rid of that. Um, it was based on Fee Gordon's Rookie to Rockstar framework. And I've just kind of adapted that to really fit and um, the way that we work, what I'd recognise, I guess, is there's lots of uh, the Tableau community initiatives that I wanted to get the, the analysts involved in and kind of growing. But there was stuff in work that really helped them to do it as well. So made it kind of work based and also aligned it to some of the certifications that were in Tableau to build that framework to really support the analysts. And before I left, I was having kind of mentoring sessions directly with them to really help encourage their growth. Um, and then on the flip side was the data consumers. So we wanted to create that community, we wanted to create that buzz and we wanted to create a champion so the first thing we did as part of the relaunch was go live with a tableau champions program so built into our portal with some training for our um, wannabe tableau champions and they would get a badge on the back of that and <laughs> when i presented some of this to people actually the thing they got really excited about was the tableau badges more than anything people wanted to be tableau champions what we encouraged um, our Tableau champions to do once they'd done the training, we would keep a log of them and they would be encouraged to come along to other things. But they would encourage them to put that on the bottom of their email. So again, rather than everyone coming to us for Tableau support, these people that we gave kind of certain training to became champions. And then when they sent emails to other people, other people would see that they were Tableau champions. And actually, I could reach out to that person rather than come centrally to the information team for support. But it really created a buzz and people were kind of trying to get the first Tableau champion badge and they celebrate it. So there was quite a lot of buzz around the Tableau champions. And we actually got some pin badges made as well as the kind of <coughs> email ones as well. We got some physical ones and sent them out with a kind of <coughs> well done. 
um, Asia Tableau Champions. And then the intention was to kind of grow their number of badges. So we'd have some product owner badges, we'd have some super users that we would give extra training to. Um, the data literary badge came as a package with a Tableau Champion. So whilst they were doing some train the basic Tableau Champions training on Tableau, they were doing data literary training as well. So they'd get two badges actually, um, which was really good to kind of get them to understand that the data literature is probably better than they think it is, but actually getting them going through a kind of formal kind of training for that. So we uplifted our skills and really pushed and created a buzz around it. In terms of um, engagement from that kind of pillar, as I mentioned, we wanted to create a Tableau community. We wanted to create that Tableau Champions buzz. We wanted to kind of create um, more people that were involved in Tableau and data than just us. And there was a number of execs that got the badge and lots of different levels of people within the, within the organisation who became champions. I think at the point, I think two weeks after we went live, um, if I vaguely remember, we had about 50 Tableau champions, which out of an active user base of 400, we thought was really good. We didn't expect that many, to be honest. Um, we, were, we, were, we launched a Tableau champions user group where we invited the champions along and then they could give some formal feedback and get involved again. So we were running them on a regular basis. In our launch week, we had, um, we called it Tableau week and we had lots of different things happening over the course of them. Five days, we had engagement sessions, we uh, kind of like an instruction to the portal, and um, we we had some competitions, we hid like this little character on the portal that people had to spot um, and gave away some goodies just to, again, and we didn't spend lots of money on it at all, it was just kind of little gimmicks that we could just get people engaged with, but there was promotions every day that our comms team supported us with, so we had a Tableau week, which was exciting. Um, we had lots of virtual training, so that week we did them every day um, to get people engaged in the new product and then run them for the following few weeks and then started to implement kind of different levels of training um, to all our users. So not just kind of a bog standard they come depending on what level they're at. We also built in how to guides. So there was a section on the portal that was showing them about all the kind of top tips, how to say favorites, custom views, things like that. And we had one of our own list record some videos so not just kind of like written top tips but actually little videos that would show them through it which were which were really great and um, it really kind of got our analysts really involved in it who were running the virtual sessions and engaging with our users and getting feedback straight away and we implemented a monthly newsletter so we could again continue to engage with our users and tell them what was new in Tableau every month and also kind of highlight some user stories so we had um, one user story every month to kind of go this is how I'm using it why don't you use it in a similar way and stuff to really kind of show that it's not just about us sitting in information, telling people what to do. So that was really uh, positive. Um, so what did that mean? So in short, we had a new user friendly portal interface. We had more collaborative development with our users. We had the more involved. We had more. We had better intuitive dashboards, new core dashboards that people could. So they knew where they were going. As I mentioned, that was always a challenge. We had dashboard recommendations built into the portal so they would pop up and people could see what else other people are using. We had a new support model with more virtual support training for people to come along to. We had a built-in guidance and data dictionary. So as I mentioned, we've got kind of some like metadata and kind of core data sitting behind that so they could see what was behind some of the logic. Um, so making that kind of really transparent. We also had the skills uh, assessment and support skills badges and we started to really uh, drive a Tableau community into and I care and drive a really data informed culture so really lifting up there was a good opportunity to really kind of evaluate our data culture within Pennine care um, and the feedback obviously I've um, not been in Pennine care now for six months but what I understand is that some of that stuff has continued to be embedded the uh, the platform has grown the number of dashboards have grown there's lots of other stuff that's happening but the feedback generally especially on kind of like the portal and the community and all the stuff that we did to support them was it was really, really passionate and people were really kind of positive about it. There was lots of stuff that we needed to do on the back of it to continue to improve it, but generally it was really positive. Um, so that was it. I think I've filled my time. Um, so thanks for listening. Uh, I was really excited to share my story and kind of bring this to my last healthcare tablet user group and share kind of my final story of kind of what we did in Pennine Care. It was a really exciting project and a massive thanks to the team because um, they pulled out all the stops of the kind of few months kind of leading up to it. It was pretty intense um, and there was a lot to do to try and get to that point. So a massive thank you for that. Um, I miss my team a lot. So they were they're legends. Um, thanks for listening. If you want to follow me on Twitter, you can do. And I'll well, blog as well there very occasionally add to. Um, but thank you. Let me uh, stop sharing my screen. I think probably quickly hand over to Mark. 
Um, um, do you want to take questions now, Ella, or do you want to link to the end? Because Lisa has asked a question in chat. Oh, uh, can do quickly. It's a couple of minutes, I think. Just how many people and how long did it take to roll out is the question. Um, the initial rollout um, when we back in 2016-17, um, once we'd done the pilot and we'd got the data sets kind of set up, so there's kind of a bit of work around that, it took us two months, two months to roll out across the organisation. So pretty quick, we did a lot of kind of um, copying the dashboards across for different elements and, and had a good data structure on these. So it was really quick to roll out and um, had at that point, I think there was about 12 people in the team, but probably like five or six people actively working on the project. Um, in terms of the relaunch, um, we'd got to a team of 18. And again, probably most of the leads were kind of leading on it. So again, probably six, seven, eight people working on the project with um, different levels of intensity, but not necessarily full time, because recognising that we had a busy information team that were also uh, supporting business as usual and everything else that's going on. So it wasn't necessarily full time. That was just the kind of time period. I think uh, that was the other question. Thank you, um, Mark. Do you want to? Um, Thank you, Ella. I will uh, attempt to share my screen. Hopefully, people can see that. Is that working? Yes, it is. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, apologies, I think I'm sharing my whole screen. So if any inappropriate Teams messages pop up, I apologize. Um, <laughs> it's entirely possible or likely, potentially. <laughs> um, so thank you. It's really just actually um, just reflecting on a load of the things that you said that kind of were really relevant. Uh, um, kind of, I guess, our journey and some of the problems and issues that we've had and how we're kind of addressing that. Um, and we'll see some of that is just by copying what Pennine have done, which we'll see in a second. Um, but also trying to come up with some kind of more focused ways of using the data and information um, to help people within the organization and kind of solve some of the issues that we have. So kind of the title is how can we kind of focus on what really matters? And uh, uh, let's just start by kind of talking a little bit about us. So we're not dissimilar to Pennine, actually. We provide mental health um, physical health and public health services, so health visiting, school nursing, uh, both inpatients and uh, community across Hampshire. So There's a population of about 1.7 million. It's quite diverse in terms of the, the kind of geographies. We've got inner city Southampton where I live, which is you know, there's areas of quite a lot of deprivation and uh, you know a real kind of interesting ethnicity mix um, right out to kind of rural New Forest, which is very kind of elderly, retired, quite wealthy community, quite rural. Um, so an information team and Tableau Centre of Excellence, as I was saying, we're about to kind of shamelessly rip off what Pennine have done. So we've recently pr procured into our its curator. So it was really good to see Ella's presentation because we're hoping to launch uh, in the next couple of months. Um, so we've got about 18 analysts, but that's kind of across all of our data warehouse preparation, IT, um, and kind of our analysts and, uh, and developers as well. And we're kind of always work to promote that kind of learning and development culture. So always trying to think about the kind of next thing that we can do um, with the data. Uh, we've had Tableau similarly about seven years now. I think I first met Ella probably about seven years ago because we procured it about the same time. Um, so we're just coming to kind of renew our contract actually and just sort of thinking about the kind of next level of what can we do with the, now we've got a kind of massive dashboards, what do we do next um, kind of idea. Just a little bit about me. Um, some head of information at the trust, uh, been here for nearly 10 years, which is a bit scary. Um, and I did commercial banking like that. So I've gone the opposite way to Ella. Uh, and um, I, I think that kind of helps in many ways because it, it gives you a kind of steer of how things kind of work in other areas of the organization. You become kind of quite NHS centric, I think sometimes, which is, which is really helpful to get those extra kind of skills and things in. Um, right. So I put this slide together and I, to be honest, I got bored after about uh, 10, 10 minutes. So these, I, I went to our main business unit dashboard, as we call it, which are all the kind of metrics that the trust that you can kind of look at. And um, this is just the first kind of two pages of things, potentially of about 20 that are kind of there that are relevant to various things. Some are relevant to everybody. Some might be relevant to just a specific service, but um, 
it's just there's kind of an absolute mass you know so some of them are kind of you know hr ones turnover sickness rates some are very much you know patient focused so access rates for services there are others that are about kind of incidents and complaints etc so there's just such a mass out there and kind of what does this kind of provoke it when somebody comes to think about data they go uh how on earth do you make kind of any sense of this and i think it's really interesting because it's just when you start to kind of peel it away and particularly if we've had tableau for seven years now and just built more and more and more kind of content there's just you know it, it's that concept that something you know any single item is important to somebody but kind of as a mass together kind of amalgamous mass they're kind of important to no one because you just can't make any sense of them and you know our teams come to do kind of a, a monthly kind of uh process of reporting so they'll report to managers above them and their managers will then report to our execs etc and it, it's kind of dreaded and it's one of those things that i find really annoying because data then becomes this kind of horrible thing because i've got to make my report and i've got to look in tableau and it's a total nightmare and how on earth do i know what to do um, and we have this kind of culture in the nhs i think that everything is important all of the time so you must talk about your sickness right and you must think about your incidents and well is that really the case so what we've been trying to do is provide a method of focusing on kind of what are the key things you might want to talk about in a given month and what are the key things, not just the kind of risks, but also the things that actually you can shout about that you've done really well and that you're improving. So what are the ways that traditionally this has been done? So there's the ragged method, as we say, so this might be familiar to some. So, you know, I'll produce my report to go up to my exec and I'll say, you know, these ones are red, these ones are green and these ones are amber. Um, and what do you do? Well, you talk about what you're doing and the things that are red, and you might maybe talk about the ones that are amber, perhaps. And I guess that's got a place. So you're looking at the things that are kind of not meeting target and saying what you're doing about them. But with all these things, it's kind of how the target's set. So, you know, IAPT is a really good example, I think, where the target is actually quite low nationally. Um, and the national average is way above the target. So you kind of, if you're just looking at the target, you're not really learning a great deal number of items don't have a target so incidents would be a really good example how do you manage incidents in something like this and you also have those permanently red <laughs> ones don't you that are there so training might be for example you're getting all your people through training but you know there just isn't the time you haven't got the staff at the moment so it's going to be red so what's actually important is is it you know improved or is it deteriorated uh, so you kind of miss that with this methodology the other kind of thing we've seen in the past is it went up went down or maybe it stayed about the same so this kind of concept you know your arrows um and again there's probably you know a place for this so it, it's interesting to see if something's gone up or down but you're not looking across a kind of longer time frame so it can be very reactionary to say kind of it went up uh, last month it went down there's nothing that indicates if it's statistically significant so we look at some of the figures that we've got on the presentation here 0.3 percent so is that a significant change or is that just really chance i guess yeah and you don't know so it's very hard to kind of focus on looking at that you know that and this is just an example i stole off the internet yesterday looking at that and saying actually from a commentary point of view what's actually interesting to talk about here if i want to talk to my manager or i want to talk to you know our exec board it's very hard to do so we've introduced a number of you i'm sure will be aware of the kind of making data count program that sam riley's introduced uh, and kind of champions which is trying to use different statistical techniques to solve some of these problems uh so we introduced it probably into our stuff you know initially many years ago um but more kind of more thoroughly i guess a couple of years ago and it's well utilized at trust and board level so we've got actually a little bottom left there is a snippet from our board report around eip um weights and that's great but the thought is is it not kind of equally or more valuable to kind of a team manager because when we talk about the ipr you know the thing about eip we send to our mental health manager he's got a couple of mental health manager kind of things they look after and hr is a really good example there's a couple of hr metrics in our ipr and we send those to our hr director and they put some commentary but the poor team manager has got all of these things to manage and potentially all of these things to talk about so surely you know a process like this is actually of more value to them than it is to to some of our execs in many ways uh, i won't go into too much detail about spc but uh, effectively what it does for those who aren't aware it kind of looks at the variation of a metric over time and then tries to say well actually is a particular data point you know is that moved from the last data point by pure chance 
or is something statistically significant happening? So do we think that something's happened that's meant that the performance has changed? So for example, have we introduced a load of new staff, so waiting times have gone down, or have we introduced a new process which meant that incidents have increased, for example? Um, so it's a really good way of trying to work out what's important to focus on. So just thinking about our SPC journey as a trust. So we introduced it sort of a couple of years ago into all of our business unit dashboards as they, we kind of call them, which is our core product that uh, teams within uh, and all levels of the trust use to kind of bring together the KPIs and things. And that was great. And uh, we use the Chris Dixon method. Thanks to Chris, he's on the call. Uh, and he's got a, a great blog there that shows you how to do that in Tableau. It's really good. Um, you know, some great calculated fields and things that um, will tell you when things are, you know, that you've got the color coding there. So you can see when something is kind of in or out of uh, sort of standard, you know, variance or something that's worth focusing on. But, you know, the feedback we still got is there's still blooming hundreds of these things. You know, how on earth do I go through a hundred and something odd charts and actually work out what the ones that I want to talk about in that given month or uh, that I need to focus on, you know, and understand what's important for my, for my team. And then we kind of took a step back and said, well, what's the problem? The problem is, I guess, that when Tableau generates these SPCs, they're really helpful, but they kind of just exist for that kind of whisper of time that you're displaying them. So as soon as I, you know, press the filter, you know, which is the great, you know, way you can do things with Tableau as a BI product, uh, it disappears and the kind of fact that, you know, the waiting times is, you know, is something that is significant for us to look at is lost for that particular team. It is it's gone, isn't it? It, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so it's really difficult for us to generate that kind of list of metrics for a team to say, well, actually, these are the things I think that you this month you should be really focusing on because they're potentially deteriorating or did you know you've done really well in this particular area? So what we needed to do was generate the kind of charts outside of Tableau or the kind of data behind the charts to be able to identify um, those that we need to include or that we need to talk about in a given period. Um, so we've developed over time our KPI table. And again, I won't go into this in too much detail because I'm sure a number of you are, are aware how these kind of things work. So within our data warehouse, once we've run everything and everything hopefully runs successfully in the morning, um, we then build our KPI table. So we take little snippets from other reporting tables and just build something that gives us the overall performance for each of our metrics. And I think it's really helpful to break this down into the kind of Tableau language of dimensions and measures. So dimensionally, we'll have a name of metric, what team was involved, what CCG, because um, that's kind of interesting. We are, get asked to report on that a lot, along with practice, who the staff member was, um, and the month that the particular thing happened. Um, and then we, measures wise, we have our sum uh, across our X and Y. So in this case, the example, we have a lot of issues sometimes with contact. So a contact goes into a diary and you know we wanna make sure it's getting outcome. So we knew whether it actually happened or not for patient safety purposes. And so we can be paid, I guess. <laughs> Uh, and this then happens, and you can obviously sum those at different levels of detail. So if you want to look at everything a particular staff member has done across numerous teams, you just sum them based upon the staff members. You would drag them through your pills in Tableau. And we also bring in some information bits like descriptions and if there's a target and stuff that we link in so that you can kind of use that data more, more kind of naturally. Um, a bit of an example here. So this is what it might look like. So this is Happy Town Health Visitors. Um, how many visits they've done by 14 days. And you can see that there are various members of staff there that do it for different practices and the kind of number of visits they actually did, which is the X and the Y is the number of visits that we think they should have done based upon the children that turned 14 days during that period. Um, and then we've got a bit of, you know, bit that we bolt on the end, which actually kind of their dimensions in reality, but they help us to understand what the data actually means. So we then take that a step further and thought, well, actually, this is exactly what we need to solve the kind of SPC problem. We need to create these tables with all the SPC data. So uh, much to the frustration of our data warehouse team, we said, well, once you've done the KPI table, can you build this other table for us as well um, that looks at actually all of the SPC information? So this is a little bit different in that you can't sum. It's at a kind of flat level of detail. So, you know, it, each there's a separate uh, kind of selection of rows for each um, each team, if you like, and each entity within the trust. So we do it at each of our reporting levels. So we've got trust, which is the whole trust, division, which is a particular geographic area, a service like AMH or older person's mental health, and a team. I'll concentrate on team for the purposes of this because I think it is kind of most valuable. Um, who that team is, um, as well as the month 
Um, and then we look at our X number, so our X and Y exactly as we did before, as well as calculating a percentage. But the difference here is we also then go on to calculate all of the different SPC elements, including the kind of in-month variation status and the in-month assurance status. And I'll come back to that in a bit. So effectively, is this a metric worth looking at? And is it something that's always going wrong and missing target? Or is it something that's actually you know, pretty good? So just very quickly, what does this look like? So this is now Happy Town Nursing for sickness. So running from the kind of top to the bottom, uh, this is just a you know an extract from our data warehouse. So the ones that are highlighted is where actually it's run the SPC rules against the data for that month. And it says, well, actually, this is something that's worth looking at. So there is kind of variation, which is different here, um, which is great. So all, all good, but kind of it's all rubbish because it's just tables and nobody likes tables and they're impossible to make any sense of. So we then kind of introduce that into Tableau through our um, metric focus report. And I'll just try the perils of a live demo <laughs> to, to give you that. So it's a very new kind of thing. So it's still developing. So whenever I look at this, I always spot something that doesn't work quite how we want it to. Um, so we'll come in here and, and actually today I will pretend to be uh, Romsey physiotherapy I haven't pre-practiced this I promise um, so if I type Romsey in here uh, which is a little town just outside Southampton so we get kind of some of the things here so today I want to look at the MSK team in Romsey so they're one of our physio teams but then we immediately came across a problem I noticed it in one of Stella uh, uh, Ella's uh, slides rather that um, everything is different in every system so if I want to look at all of the metrics that are important, I need to select our clinical. So we called that in the clinical systems. In finance and workforce, I think we're called Romsey Physiotherapy. Um, in the patient and care experience survey software, I think it's this ortho choice one. Um, and in terms of quality governance, so where we'd um, where we kind of you know record if we've got instance or risks, I think it's that Romsey Physio. That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And if I apply that. I then get the thing. So this, for the month of January, are the things that are triggering within that table that we kind of need to focus on. So we break it down by the kind of SPC rules and the making debt account rules, if you're right. So uh, metrics with a deteriorating trend. So they're all the, these are all the things that are deteriorating. Um, so progress notes. So, you know, we're not signing off our notes perhaps as well as we were. Um, budget variance. So we've got a deteriorating trend. The little icon here. So if there is a target, it will use the kind of assurance methodology to say, well, actually, the budget variance is um, kind of, uh, you know, it's deteriorating, but we're still on target. And this is where I think the power of it comes in, because it might be actually, well, I want to have a look at that, because is it going to be that in two months time, I'm going to be going and asking for a load more money, because, <laughs> you know, I, uh, we're deteriorating, but actually, we're not below that kind of target yet in terms of our spending. And it's really helpful that I pick that now as opposed to going back when we we're already like massively overspent in three months time. Um, and it goes through with that way. So metrics with improving trends. So these are all things we might want to shout about. We also have ones where there is no kind of um, variation, if you like, that we want to worry about. So the, the SPC rules say that it's just kind of standard variation. It's no really different to the month before, but there's target issues. So, you know, we're always doing consistently badly in terms of our turnover, for example. Um, we've used some of the Tableau kind of technology as well to say, you know, if we click here, we can get actually the chart to appear. Again, using Chris Dixon's great technology <laughs> down the bottom here to do that. Um, we can also have a look at uh, the trend over time. So how many are triggering? So we can say, you know, if there are more metrics that are triggering as a worry um, over time, that's kind of, you know, blue ones, then that's perhaps a concern. So they can think about it in that way. We've also provided something here to say, actually, what are the active teams? So use the little um, thing to say, what are the teams that we're focusing on um, at this specific time? So it's just designed to give that ability to have a starting point when you're writing your kind of reports and you're thinking about performance as opposed to having to go through everything kind of, you know, that, that, that's in a particular um, element. So let me just pop back to the presentation. Um, but what is the problem with that? So you saw immediately as we started to do this, you got the multiple system problem where, you know, there are various things that feed through for a specific team, but they come from all different systems. Um, and that's really annoying because you have to select multiple filters all the time to make sure you're getting all of the metrics that you want to see. Um, so what the approach is here, well, we, we saw the select each of the uh, different teams um, from the Tableau filter, but people really quickly get confused. I mean, I'm, 
I don't think I got that Romsey one right, for example, because I don't think some of those are the same entities and it's really confusing for people. Um, there is a kind of approach three, actually, which I didn't put on here, which we, we did go through, which is go to each of the different owners of those systems and try and ask them to change the names and get unified. We tried that for about six months and then gave up because, <laughs> you know, as soon as that person changes or um, something happens, it, it just kind of reverts to type. We also find that particularly with finance, for example, they want to do things like put little abbreviations after the names to talk about their tax status and things like that, which are just not helpful. And they need to do that um, so that doesn't work. So what we've done is create a kind of grouping table um, that brings all of that together. So let me just um, have a look there, back into our live demo. And this is something that we're hoping over time teams will maintain. So if we look at Andover Community Mental Health Team, for example, their clinical code is called Andover CMHT. Their finance and workforce is CMHT Andover, and that's its code, and that's their kind of quality governance recording. Um, and what does that allow us to do? Well, it allows us, if we go into the back into there, to just select the one thing. So we can select just Andover CMHT as a benchmarking team, and then all of those KPIs you know, will come through into that one view. The other thing it allows us to do is kind of a, a, a more centralized monitoring. So um, a number of you possibly have the same problem that we have is that we're always asked is, well, how can we get Tableau to show us what the risk teams are? And I want Tableau to tell me who's going to kind of fall over as a team in three months time. And it's kind of a bit crystal ball and a bit difficult to do. Um, so the approach we've taken is to use this. If I'm looking at January for community mental health teams, this is effectively all of the the variation here that's kind of showing um, teams that have got things that are deteriorating or are not good, if you like, based upon those rules. So we can see actually we can rank them from the top, which is Ferrum and Gosport, which has got 28 things potentially that are problematic, um, right down to Haven't, which have got 15. So, you know, actually, are we saying that Ferrum and Gosport might be worth a kind of a bit more focus and a bit more help and assistance from there? And there's ability to do things like choose the metrics if you want to exclude certain things um, and have a look from there. Um, if we click here, we can see what those metrics are, and we can also start to see the team history. So again, we, we can see the numbers that are triggering in each of the different areas, like finance and workforce and clinical um, across time. So what are the next stages? As we started to program in, we've started to find that some metrics work a lot better than others um, for doing this. Um, some of them like finance is a really good one and you saw probably on there there's quite a lot of finance ones that trigger and this is around things like uh, finance love to do like a balancing entry don't they in a given month to like give a team 100 grand or take it away the next month and of course all of those things are going to trigger SPC um, uh, but they might not be relevant I guess that's kind of okay because you know as a team manager you can look at that and say well actually uh, you know it's triggered that but I know that that's some obscure things so that's okay but it kind of causes a bit of a problem then when we start ranking the team so thinking about that how that works um multiple teams into the same entity so uh, with the spc you can have problems where there are kind of you know four different caseloads are actually one team because you're then trying to look at four different charts at the same time and it gets a bit kind of mind-boggling um education program so ella talked a lot about you know getting people engaged so how are we going to kind of explain to people in a really usable way uh, how they can use this to help them in terms of you know understanding what are the things that matter um, from them and I guess what we're trying to do and we've actually just started engaging with our performance director yesterday on some of this stuff is to say well how do we get this from a true kind of ward to board process I know Ella used that same analogy so that everybody's using this in their performance management process what we find at the moment one of the issues we get around the performance group and the exec performance group as we call it there is everybody wants to use a different template so in one division they've got this excel spreadsheet in another division they've got this word document that they put all of their stuff in and it kind of is a nightmare because then you know the, the stuff that we produce works for no one because everyone is using a slightly different process so what we're really keen to do is use this as a catalyst to say well actually you know if you use this as just you know the first page of your report that you give up to your manager or the manager gives to our exec team should always be the metric focus page um, and that way you know you can start with that and then you can start talking about your commentary underneath that and it will you know help you to focus on the things that really matter um, for, for patients and, and you know for making sure your team is you know doing the best that it can 
Um, thank you. Uh, if anybody's seen anything they do find interesting, kind of happy to talk it through in further detail. I understand it's kind of a little bit of a whistle stop tour of what we've been doing. And one of the things that I love presenting these things and quite selfishly really at quite an early stage is that there's normally somebody who's got exactly the same problem or is trying to do the same thing. And it's really obviously helpful to share um, to share any learning that we've had to be able to do that. And, you know, we're really happy to do that. It'd be great to talk through with, with others. Um, so please do, do get in touch. That was fab. Thank you so much, Mark. I think um, you might have blown our minds. Sorry. <laughs> it's brilliant. No, it's really clever and it's really, really I think, good, it? Yeah, I, I think it was interesting what you were saying about the kind of relaunch, and this is kind of what we're trying to do, and it's trying to say, actually, as part of the relaunch, we want to have things that are just, this is much easier way of accessing Tableau, and it's kind of the same, but at the same time, I want to say, well, actually, it's, this is, you know, we're trying to make it analytics better as well um, in terms of how you approach that. Fab. Great. Thank you so much for presenting today. Um, I think we might have a quick question. Let's quickly take that because we're slightly behind time, but why not? Sorry. Uh, on. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> um, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it comes from Nicholas. Tableau can be engineered to offer SPC and as you have to be you have facilitated end users to access data via Tableau examining outliers, et cetera. After trying to achieve similar goals, the challenge has been to encourage end users to utilize your reporting system. What has been the feedback from your clients? So we, at the moment, we've got a couple of um, a couple of our performance team that are utilizing this and are really keen because obviously they're the ones that guide the kind of thing. I think at the moment that the, the thing that we're learning is, is the getting it right bit. So one of the things obviously is a massive issue I haven't touched on hugely in this is every metric needs to be mapped. And if it isn't, um, you know, then it doesn't appear. But obviously that's a real risk because there could be something that's deteriorating and somebody doesn't know. Um, also the grouping thing, we hadn't really planned to do that when we first started this. We just said, well, you know, you're just going to have to choose all of the teams in, you know, that are in the, the thing. Then we found that actually it was just too hard for people to do. They're just not, they don't want to do that or they just don't understand it. So I think it's trying to make it as simple as possible and break it down to, and I think what's nice with this is you don't really need to understand the SPC. You kind of do, but it, ultimately, as long, if something says, these are the things you should look at because they're deteriorating, these are things you could look at because they're improving, um, then you know that in itself is, is kind of okay you don't necessarily need to understand how we got to that position um, and i think that's really the feedback we've had so far we launched it first it was just far too complicated and trying to keep it and make it as simple and easy as possible great thank you thanks mark right we're going to move swiftly on uh, emma is going to run a quiz that you can all join into so please um take part um, just to say, Emma, I don't know if we had this conversation, but there will be prizes for the top two people. Um, can't tell you exactly what they're going to be, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you will get a nice email surprise. Um, so for the top two people. So once uh, we get to that point, we'll grab some email addresses. And um, let me hand over to Emma and share the screen. Thanks, Ella. That's an exciting uh, announcement. I'm a bit gutted now that you've asked me to do the quiz rather than participate. <laughs> Price for all. Um, hi everyone, every user group, pretty much we do a quiz. Um, it uses Kahoot, so you can see the instructions at the top there, hopefully for how you can join it. You can either join it online using that website or have the app if you already have it. Um, and then it will just tell you to put your game pin in and put in a cool name. You can either use your own name or a nickname or a tableau joke, but I can't give you extra points for that, unfortunately. But still go ahead and put something cool and tableau related in if you want. I'll just give you a few minutes to get that loaded up. Some of you are super quick, very impressive. So I hope I haven't made this quiz too hard. I've taken a lot of the uh, questions from um, from like 
past papers for actual certification and therefore they might be quite difficult but if I think that they're difficult then I've assigned them double points um, I don't know if it'll tell you when they're double points because I can't remember but some of them if they're particularly difficult double points wait a few more moments Ella do you know if people can join in a bit later if they haven't got it sorted now can they kind of yeah I think they can jump in at any point obviously if you're not it'll mark you down but the quicker you're getting there's 32 people on the call so in theory we should have a few more so a few yet to do but um I guess we need to crack on <laughs> yeah I'm just conscious of time so if we give you 30 more seconds and then we'll jump in Yeah, because I can't handle the awkward silence any longer. Please do press start and we'll crack on. Um, so, welcome to the quiz. Your first question is coming up. In a calculated field, if you wanted to add a comment, you should use the following syntax. So if you don't know in Kahoot, you get points for being right and you also get points for being fastest. Very good, most of you getting that one right. Next question, please. Okay, so multi-select, so there's two correct answers in this one. So interactive elements that you can add to your dashboard for users include the two following. All very mixed, but most people going for green. Interesting. And uh, next. Oh, a clear leader coming out at the moment. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, next question. A field that shows the average home value for the United States in 2016 is most likely A. Yeah, very good. Most of you getting that one correct. Let's see who's winning. Still Abby, very good. Next question, what are custom fields that define a subset of data based on same conditions called? Very good again, most of you getting that correct. Oh, Steve, Steve's riding up. Next. A scatter plot that has two colours identifying different categories is a good example of which principle? So this is your uh, bit of psychology coming in there. Oh, very interesting. Completely through the field, that one.
Which of the following is the best reason to extract data instead of using a live connection? So this is a double points answer, I think. Most be getting that one correct. Maybe it didn't need to be a double points one. Abby's still at the top, looks unbeatable at this point, but Chris is rising up. Which of the following is not a Tableau desktop application? And I think this one is a bit of a tricky one. That's a bit of a trick question, I think. Most of you got that one, but three of you thrown, which I was, and going for Tableau Public. Which of the following file types contain a Tableau workbook along with a local data file? Are oh, you quick on this one? Everyone's used to saving their docs. Very good. It's getting close. In Tableau, data blending is where you. Very good, most of you getting that one. In the data pane, you will find, see how well you've memorized what it looks like. Interesting, people use it every day and which of the following data pane items cannot be dragged onto the filters shelf? Very good, most of you getting that one. Oh, Chris, apparently you're on fire. But not winning though. In the data pane, the discrete values are colored. Which color? Don't be fooled by the color of the button. That's a bit of a mental workout for you this morning. Very good. CD coming in to beat Chris. Which of the following is the best description of a Tableau story? Very good, most of you getting that one.
Oh no, this one is worth double points. You've created a group by selecting field labels in a view. How can you then remove members from this group? There's a bit of extra time to allow people to do reading. And double points, all playful right at the end. Most of you getting that one. So now let's find out who's the winner. Coming third is Chris. Well done, Chris. And in second, we've got CD. And in first place, I don't think this will be a surprise. Abby, well done. And we've got runners up are Steve and LM. Well done, everyone. I hope that was a bit of fun. Um, as, as I said, we will work out prizes and get into contact with you after. Um, I'll now hand over to the next session, which I don't have the agenda up in front of me. So it is David. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Um, how are we looking for time at the moment, Ella? Um, we, you've probably got 15. Okay, cool. Right. Let's do 15. So let me just set up and share my screen and get my presentation started hopefully you will see some slides coming up now um i can't see the chat but please do put questions in chat um i'll explain who i am now then so uh i'm david i'm from tableau i've been with tableau for about six and a half years um i'm mostly focused in the middle east uh you you were supposed to have a healthcare focused person today but we're going through our, our sort of start of financial year so um, resources are all off-site doing various uh, group-oriented activities. So you've got me for the uh, fun today. Um, well done on the quiz, I have to say, very quickly. I was uh, playing along and uh, found it quite challenging in places, so that was good. Um, but let's get on to what I, why I'm here today, just to go through uh, what's new in Tableau. Uh, and I put it together um, with respect to the last 12 months. So um, there's been four releases uh, over that period of time. Uh, and we'll get on with the presentation. Uh, we now generally, as part of Salesforce, we always show this forward-looking statement uh, thingy. What it means is I, if you ask any questions about our future plans, I can answer them, and then we're not held responsible for things, stupid things that I might say. So that's all very good. Um, moving on to our mission, uh, always been the same. Uh, we are here to help people see and understand data. Um, and in particular, I really want to thank you as one of the many user groups that we have, uh, because without you, we the, the tool would not really exist. It wouldn't be as successful as it is, and, and it wouldn't continue to grow in the way that it does. So I do want to uh, truly say thank you for attending today and for allowing me to present to you as well. Um, along with the mission, we're always trying to push the data culture angle. So we do have a sort of uh, a variety of things that we are focusing on away from the, the, the product itself. And that relates to sort of softer uh, elements such as the Tableau blueprint, if you've not heard about it, which is the process of hopefully deploying Tableau in a, in a meaningful way across your organization. And also there's a number of uh, playbooks and things that we have related to data culture and to try and build the culture that you guys and girls are so uh, such a big important part of in your organization. Now in terms of the presentation today, um, what I'm really, uh, what I've decided to do is group our um, the features that we've introduced over the past year uh, into the areas that we see ourselves moving more towards in the future. So, if you're looking for um, guidance of what the kind of things Tableau are doing with the tool over the next sort of twelve months, twenty four months, even further out, these are the kind of groups that we're using to define a, a lot of the product direction. Um, what I didn't want to do and actually couldn't do is just sort of run through uh, uh, all the details, all the features that actually existed in the, uh, that have been pulled out in the last uh, 12 months. Um, you, I'll be able to provide these slides later so you can look at these for, for reference, but these are just the highlights of each release that we've had over that period of time. Um, um, but I, you know, even there, there's too many to go through. So what I'm really doing is just going to focus on what I consider to be my favorites, the things that have made most difference to the customers that I work with 
or in some cases, the ones that will make a difference. Because obviously some of them are quite new and not necessarily uh, in play or in practice yet with the, with the customers that I work with. Um, what else was I gonna say there? So uh, it, I'm also covering the sort of the broader Tableau platform. So it could be that some of you either don't have access to some of these functions or you know, even if you upgraded, and um, please just, if there's any confusion or if you've got any questions around whether you'd have access, let me know in, in the chat and I'll get to the chat later. Uh, I can't see the chat window at the moment while I'm presenting. So uh, yeah, please, please just drop in any questions you can and we'll try and address them later. Um, so over the last four releases in the area of unlocking your data, uh, so this is trying to make sure that everybody has access to data, um, more and more so, which isn't just about connections or connectors, it's about actually how we make the most of the data that we have, um, have access to, whether that be securing it, you know, allowing a, a better sharing across an organization, all those types of things. Um, one of the big things that we had uh, in the most recent release was something called virtual connections. Now this is a bit of a sort of an admin oriented feature, um, but it's one that if you have an organization that is taking advantage of some security features like row level security, it will it could make a massive difference to you. Um, it will mean that you have essentially one or maybe just a handful of connections to deal with uh, or, or control or look after um, for your users rather than potentially tens or hundreds or you know thousands of different data sources that you have to connect through in order to uh, access the, uh, the data. Um, when you can combine this with the older feature of relationships, you suddenly end up with a very powerful data model that can control and um, uh, help people, um, help the admins control and access the data without having to build lots and lots of different uh, data sources. And I think for people who you know are experienced with Tableau, it's a good reason now to actually go back and perhaps look at the way that you're dealing with your data strategy and look to see whether this, this particular function could really uh, um, Add something new to your organization. Um, as I mostly focus for uh, for um, uh, sort of data owners, creators, etc. Uh, but but explorers and obviously viewers will benefit from it certainly in terms of performance, speed, and control. Uh, also in uh, twenty two point four, we've had uh, data sources that can be uh, you can now edit them within the browser. Before you'd have to publish, and then you have all sorts of uh, shenanigans about trying to update them. Uh, but now you can actually go into the browser uh, and, and make a change to those data connections. So I think that's quite a nice biggie. Um, also creating extracts in the browser. That's another one. So you've perhaps seen the theme here in 2021.4. Uh, we did a lot of browser-based uh, uh, improvements. Uh, so yeah, creating extracts in the browser. I think it's pretty straightforward in terms of what that is, but nice bit of extra functionality. Um, for those of you who are using our data prep tool, um, or I should say uh, prep conductor, I always forget the names, not prep builder. So um, previously you couldn't chain tasks together. Um, for those of you using it, you'll understand that you process data, you put it into a, a, a data source that other people can access, but actually there may be a number of steps that people want to perform. So, you know, you run a job, you build a data set, you then want to build a second data set either off that or combining another set of data, et cetera, et cetera. And you want to be able to chain them together. Um, and that's quite a nice uh, capability that we've added just now. Um, generate rows, this came out in 2021.3. Um, and this is, I think for those of you who are familiar or used to Tableau uh, from the past, we used to, we, well, we still have elements of data scaffolding, we call that's the term that we use. Uh, you, you sometimes need to add in data to make things work, make the data structure work for the visualization that you're trying to produce. So through data prep, you'll be able to generate rows. And that was something you really couldn't do with Tableau before. You're always working with the data as it is in situ, rather than being able to say, well, we need, you know, we haven't got the data for the month of May, but we need a row that represents May in order to uh, uh, display that effectively in the, in the uh, in a dashboard. So that's a nice little um, add on that we've got there. And now one very technical one. Uh, so don't want to put everybody off. Um, but we've started moving more towards containerization uh, within the tool. Uh, if you don't know what that is, don't worry. Uh, it's just that it's, it's able to, it, it makes admins better able to deploy the software more quickly, you know, install and maintain and upgrade uh, in a more effective manner. 
Um, and this is just to start. We're, we're sort of moving down this route of containerization, but it's a long process. So this is just the uh, um, yeah the first few steps we're making in that kind of way, um, which will be very interesting to certain admins, I'm sure. So moving on to the second topic and keeping a note of time, uh, making decisions faster. So what we're really talking about now is the the, the core traditional Tableau product, i.e. making the interface, the analytics, the interactions with the data itself better and easier to use. Uh, you may have noticed in 2021.1, uh, we introduced quick LODs. Uh, for me, this is a godsend because I always struggled with LODs, level of detail calculations. It's always been a bit of a, uh, uh, you know, slightly uh, more technical level of, of, uh, sort of calculations that you can set up in Tableau. So we've allowed people to do it straight from the interface without having to uh, write code directly, which is uh, pretty handy, I would say. Um, the next area that I'm focusing on is there's been quite a dramatic improvement in the mapping capabilities over the last year. So we started in 2021.2, uh, I might have been one, I think. We started adding more and more functionalities, in particular uh, adding layers. But then we began to build on that. So whether you could lock the layers, view the layers, um, uh, adding things like spatial calculations, so actually being able to um, work at the area of a polygon on a particular chart, um, do things like spatial join. So if you do have two images or two polygons uh, and they're overlaid, you can perhaps do questions that relate to the number of points or marks or whatever it might be that are within those those two polygons together. A typical, I'm trying to think of a typical uh, uh, application, but it might, you, you might have a, a region or a zone and you might have uh, the, the, you know, serves a particular practice or hospital, and then you might have drive time or something like that from uh, uh, ambulance data or information. And you're trying to say, right, how many patients would this cover when you combine those two things together? Um, and then finally, in 21.4, uh, we started adding in, in um, the ability to do mapping with multiple data sources, which I didn't actually realize we couldn't do. Uh, it was one of those things I thought, oh, yes, so of course we could do it. And then I went to check and there, lo and behold, you couldn't. Uh, so this is taking multiple data sources and being able to put them on the same map without having to do a uh, like a dual axis or anything weird like that. It's, it's bringing them all together in the same slot. So very handy, I think. As you can see, a general pattern there in terms of uh, improving the mapping capabilities. Um, also some lighter touches in terms of metrics. I don't know whether you're using these, but they're particularly handy on things like uh, uh, mobile devices for basically summarizing metrics that other people will be able to uh, quickly look at without having to deep dive into a particular dashboard. Uh, and we've tidied them up and colored them out and just give them, you know, filled them out to make them a little more useful. So uh, I don't know whether you can spot the differences there from you know what you see on the screen now to what they used to be, but there's a couple of extra coloring, slightly a uh, few of the marks that, that hopefully just make them a little bit richer and more useful for people. Uh, and I think, I can't remember which version this was, but we've also, you can now, see which dashboard actually generated the metrics because previously they kind of just appeared uh, uh and it wasn't necessarily obvious where they came from so we're sort of they, they're quite tightly linked in the interface now with the other uh, dashboards that made them speeding along um we have a whole area related to uh embeddedness i don't even know whether that's an appropriate word but it's uh the idea of applications uh, that might use Tableau or feed into Tableau. Now, um, you may or may not have seen this, but we have a, we've, we've had an extension gallery for some time, uh, which is where third parties have been able to provide tools that can be embedded directly into Tableau dashboards. Uh, previously, you had to go to a separate website, you'd have to download some files, and then you might, uh, with some help, be able to get the thing working in your dashboard. Now, in theory, you can just drag the uh, extension straight into your tool, by going through the gallery that's actually within the tool itself. So we're trying to make it easier for people to get to those third party applications, third party graphics or connectors or whatever it might be. Um, and actually we've then built on this as a, as a concept. So we have something called the Tableau Exchange. So it isn't just about extensions, it can be about connectors. Uh, and we see this, I mean, it's early days now, uh, but we see this being as an area for enhancing a lot of Tableau's capabilities where third parties are able to Add or embed things within to the uh, within to Tableau itself, and then you as users will be able to utilize them after that. Obviously, there would some will have some license constraints with the third party, but uh, you know, I would just say go in there, find out, see if there's anything that's of use to you, and uh, you know, have the conversations about licensing after that. Um, the other thing we've done is add something called 
uh, accelerators. Now we bought a company called uh, Lintao uh, and they provided um, pre-built dashboards for verticals and for um, sort of uh, general capabilities within organizations. Um, the aim here is that if you are struggling with the sort of blank canvas of tab Tableau to come up with the dashboards that you really want to look at, um, you can go here. In fact, you can download them now from Tableau Public uh, and take the advice of people who've done it, who've done it before, who've provided uh, uh, best practice on how to do it and actually attach these pre-existing dashboards perhaps to your own data. So there's like a mapping process you go through from uh, uh, the dashboard itself to copying and putting it on top of your data set. But the idea is we're just trying to make that sort of speed to uh, speed to uh, the, the time it takes to build that dashboard or get to the end result as quickly as possible. Uh, timings, I think, do shout if I'm running out of time, but I'm speeding through. Uh, de democratizing AI, we are trying to uh, make it possible that everybody can use or benefit from AI. So there's a lot of interest around machine learning, AI, et cetera, et cetera. But really from Tableau, we're trying to do it in a way that enhances the user's capability rather than just as a magical box that goes away and does magical things. Although we do have one of those in the pipeline. So, uh, you know, um, <laughs> hold tight for that information. But what we have done is we've increased the uh, capability of explained data. You are probably familiar with that, but we've changed the interface now and we've actually made it uh, available to viewers. So it isn't just explorers who have access. In theory, anybody in the organization can use explained data. And actually, I find a, a nice link here between this and the, the previous presentation with Mark, I think it was, where you have uh, process control charts and that kind of thing, and you have outliers that actually want to know, well, I have an outlier, but why is it an outlier? That's a perfect example for using explained data, whereas I guess it's sometimes marketed as, oh, just click on a mark and it will tell you stuff. No, I think if you're looking for things, it's, uh, uh, I'd almost describe it as not explained data, it's, that it's a what the heck happened to my data kind of tool. But it, it's one that I really encourage my, my users to use as much as possible because it's, it's got quite a lot of power within it. And so we've changed the interface a little bit. Uh, it's kind of more powerful. Uh, it should be easier to use. And we have a nice little pop out that comes from the, uh, the side of the tool now rather than uh, actually forget what happened to it before, but we, it, it, it's different. Um, we've improved as data. Um, I'll whiz through this one. We've just basically made it better so that it can uh, handle the English language better than it did before. There were things like some uh, phrases you wouldn't be able to use within the data set because they were reserved items like filtering and uh, things like that. Uh, so definitely some improvements there. I'll whiz through this. I've got it on the screen so you can see it and by all means ask some questions later on. Um, and then we've also got on an AI point of view, we've incorporated or integrated more and more with the, one of the Salesforce products called Einstein so that you can now do uh, supervised learning within Tableau. So there's a predictive tool that will show you, uh, make help you make predictions for a particular classification and also give you advice on how to improve or, 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 or reduce uh, whatever that key metric might be within your organization. So uh, that embedding, taking advantage of some of the capabilities of the, the, our larger Salesforce companies uh, is something that we're, we're, we are focusing on and that, um, on the side of prediction, we've also included a lot of capability within the prep tool, which would allow you to do things like bulk scoring of information quickly and easily. Uh, so just baking the predictions into the data source that other people might end up using. And then I think this is finally, so I'm hoping I'm still on time. Uh, we, we're looking at collaboration, just trying to make it easier for everybody to work together, uh, perhaps grouping um, content uh, using collections, uh, making it easier for people to find things that are on the server that, you know, perhaps they struggled to sign and uh, find in the past. Um, being able to copy objects from other dashboards, so uh, being able to reuse content or, 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 or elements that other people have used before. Um, and one of my favorites, which is the personal space, uh, you, you could kind of always build a personal space before, but it's now its official thing, as in it's an area where you can build content, it's your own area before it has to get published and seen by other people. So it's just your own play space, essentially, to, 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 to experiment and design things. And then, of course, again, leaning on the, the bigger aspect of Salesforce, we have Slack, which we Salesforce acquired as well. Um, and that is, if you don't use it, I 
I like Slack. I loved it. I loved it before we bought it. Tableau used to use it a lot. It's a great communication tool. So you know, I'm a bit, a bit of a fan of that. Um, and he's basically been able to embed some of the Tableau elements within Slack. But going forward, there's going to be more and more integration within the uh, the Slack tool, which will enable you to see and understand data, but from uh, essentially the, the the communication tool that Slack is. Um, so as I mentioned, there's more details. I'm not going to go through all these. I'm just showing them on the display because I know it's been recorded and you can quickly pause the video and go back to them later on. Um, and I will pause there or we'll stop there and see how the comments are. If anybody has any particular comments? Or ah, thank you. It was just a question about how much does the prediction license, license cost? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I know it's published on the website. Uh, so it's um, if you go to Salesforce and look for uh, Einstein discovery in Tableau, I do a quick Google search for that. Uh, it should take you to a link on the, the Salesforce platform and uh, Salesforce website and it will tell you. Great. Uh, thank you very much. That was really helpful. Thanks for presenting today. Appreciate you coming along. No, my pleasure. And again, thank you for everybody on the call for all the stuff and work that you do. No, thank you. Right then, uh, Steve and Julia, if you want to uh, hand over to you too and to uh, end the day. Oh, can you see my screen okay? Yep. I'll hand over to Julia to introduce us first. It might be on mute, Julia. No. Sorry. <laughs> I can't believe I've done that. <laughs> oh dear. Right. Okay. I was just saying how um, happy I was to be asked to come today and <laughs> present to you. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, we just want to tell you about um, a project that we're doing at the moment. We're just starting it and um, we um, hope that, um, you know, um, people here today might want to get involved in, in this project with us. Um, so um, it's myself, Julia Wilkins. Um, I lead the data analytics at the Health Economics Unit and um, obviously Steve Adams here, who's the um, expert Tableau coaching, training and support consultancy, Biz DJ. And we were commissioned to do a project um, that Steve and I are going to collaborate on by UCLP, which is an academic health science partnership um, in London. So if we um, go to the next slide. So CBD Action. So CBD Action is uh, the name of the project. And it builds on a national program called CBD Prevent. Um, and that program is a national audit. And, and basically, um, it's looking to um, use data from primary care to um, provide information back to clinicians to help them with their quality improvement um, activities. Um, so they're looking for patients that require action, basically. Um, and they're going to cover six key high risk conditions and all of those conditions actually lead to the um, stroke, heart attack and dementia were obviously very big um, causes of mortality in the NHS, as, as you all know. Um, so if we just go to the next slide, please. So, so CBD Prevent at the moment, um, the data is collected by NHS Digital through automatic um, data extraction um, from GP practices. About 95% of GP practices have signed up. And then this data is um, collated nationally by NHS Digital. And it's then um, served back to um, the uh, community. Um, and you know anybody who's got access to um, Viewpoint, the, the um, Tableau Analytics portal, um, will be able to see this data. Um, it's, it's open basically, um, and I think actually it's, you can get to it from there is a website via NHS Digital for CBD Prevent. Um, but if anybody's interested, I can I can post a link to to this tool 
um, on the chat and, uh, after this talk. But um, but basically, um, this dashboard is the data is collated at patient level. Um, they process it at NHS Digital, and it comes back in um, this sort of relatively simple benchmarking type Tableau dashboard. Um, the issue that this dashboard has is it will tell a practice um, how, they, how they're doing compared to everyone else and, you know, um, uh, against a number of metrics. But what it doesn't do is tell the GPs which patients they need to do something about to change their performance for the better. Um, so CBD action is that next level. Um, and of course, you know, this wouldn't be an open dashboard if it did go down to identifiable patient level. Um, so um, we need to come up with a, a dashboard that will tell the GPs which patients are amenable to change to improve um, outcomes in these sort of high risk conditions. Um, but it's done so in a secure way that isn't an IG nightmare and is actually really useful for GPs rather than just being another dashboard to run to. Um, so that's what we're proposing to do um, with this project. So what we've said we will do is we will um, build a Tableau dashboard um, based on some test data that replicates the data that, that, that is being extracted from their practices. Um, and we will um, provide local systems, so the local BI teams that already use Tableau for other clinical reporting, this dashboard for them to use locally. So we are providing the search queries that they don't have at the moment just because it's automatically done through GPEs. We're going to give them the search queries to interrogate their own systems. And then the data can be used um, to um, power the Tableau dashboard. So in that way, we're giving local systems the tools to do it themselves. Um, it's a tool they're already used to using. Um, and um, Steve, I don't know if you've clicked on because you didn't want me to do that slide or... Sorry. My, my apologies. But yeah, go on to the next slide, <laughs> next one. Yeah, okay. So um, just as an example of the sorts of things that um, this dashboard will, will help them do, for example, is um, for patients with um, atrial fibrillation, um, um, we would want to know um, which patients haven't been assessed for stroke risk. That's a really important um, element of managing patients with atrial fibrillation. We'd also want to know which patients um, diagnosed with atrial fibrillation um, were on anti, um, anticoagulant, anticoagulant medication um, and which have had the, the renal function tests um, in the last year. Um, those that are, have, have got AF and CVD um, diagnosed, but they're not on a statin. Um, and then um, looking for patients um, that should actually be on, on, on registers, because all of these things contribute to better patient outcomes. So we need to know the patients that you know, don't fall within um, those parameters and, and, and therefore could be dealt with more, more effectively. Um, so yes, yeah, so we just pop onto the next slide, Steve. So, um, yeah, so the dashboard. Um, Do you want to hand over to me, Julian? I'll, I'll walk through the next few yeah. slides. Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. Um, so, the, the overriding principle of the dashboard itself as part of this project is that it needs to be easy to deploy, easy to use, and easy to be able to take action from. So, very simple, common requirements of any dashboard. Um, I thought it was also quite important to, to run through the numbers as well, because whenever we are building a dashboard, it's always useful to obviously remind ourselves what the primary objective is here. And cardiovascular disease is um, the primary cause of death in 25% of premature deaths throughout the United Kingdom. As Julia has mentioned, um, there are three diseases that we're focusing on within that cardiovascular range. And we are focusing on six specific conditions which cause those particular cardiovascular diseases, the most common conditions available. And obviously what we're trying to do is identify patients who have those conditions who aren't getting the appropriate uh, medication or treatment. So within the CVD prevent 
project, we identified or they identified 21 key performance indicators which are important for us to measure, monitor and manage throughout the whole of that process. And each of those individual key performance indicators then has various different uh, groupings uh, which are of significant importance for us to analyze as well. And there are 68 bands in total across all of those key performance indicators. So keeping it easy to deploy, easy to use and easy to action is our challenge in that environment. And also the fact that we want to apply this to about 95% coverage of GPs in England and Wales as well. So those are that's the key remit of what we're trying to deliver with this dashboard and approach. And the approach we're doing to develop this is to go through various different phases. So the very first phase is the uh, is what I refer to as 0 0.1. We are talking to a group of people, a clinical reference group, and we're getting their user stories from them. How do they need to use and operate the dashboard in the environment that they work through? In parallel to that, then we're actually creating a dummy data set, which will mirror those 21 key performance indicators and those 68 different bands across all the different uh, organizations so that we can start developing exploratory analysis in light of the user stories that are being provided to us by that clinical reference group. And that will then lead us through to a wireframing process where we design a template dashboard to review with that clinical reference group. Uh, we will then get approval from that clinical reference group that the wireframe process is correct before we then go on to build our first version of that dashboard. Once we've actually built that first version, though, we will go back to the CRG to get their feedback, make any amendments, and then move on to the next phase. This is still development phase at this stage, because the next phase is we're going to move on to a pilot. In that pilot, we will get pilot data, real data into the dashboard, and therefore we will need to just review that the dashboard is still working with that real data in there. So we'll do a functional test with that data. But also because it's got real data in it, we'll start understanding whether or not we've actually designed the look and feel and the dashboards are working properly with that real data in there. Do we have the extremities coming through? Are we identifying all the outliers? Are we also able to identify the interrelationships between those different outliers properly? So we'll do some usability testing on that real data prior to then going back to the pilot itself to get their feedback and make sure that they're able to use the dashboard in the way that they need to make any revisions. And then we will go into the phase one where we will actually roll this program out. Um, and Julia mentioned we're asking people to get involved. It's the next phase that we're really interested in some sort of uh, commitment to, but also phase one as well. So Julia's going to come on to that later. But in phase two, we're looking to then take that, that, set, that dashboard and also the data to new levels. So we're going to be looking to see how we can enhance the dashboard and perhaps have spin-off dashboards which are uh, able to apply in different areas because the data itself will be really rich and really useful to uh, make complementary decision-making throughout the users. In terms of the output then, uh, Julia touched upon it earlier on, but just to be clear on this, we're, we're looking to deliver a Tableau workbook template together with the ready-made search queries so that uh, the tool itself is a, is a toolbox that can be implemented into current day-to-day -day practices. And it will be implemented by the CSUs, the ICSs and the PCNs themselves. So we're providing that template which can be readily adaptable. And the benefits of that approach are that it will be quick to deliver through the dashboard patient level case finders for the various different conditions. It will be complete because we're taking a simple application or delivering a simple application, but it's got a lot of complex logic in there in terms of the interrelationships. So we'll be uh, making a more complete identification of patients that need some sort of assistance or care. But it's also a flexible approach because it's enabling organizations to integrate the dashboard itself with ongoing initiatives and their own platforms as well. So we know that there's a, there will be people who will take the template and just deploy it as is. There will be other organizations who will want to actually change the template and use it as a current toolbox and integrate other aspects into the way that we're putting it onto their Tableau environment. And having done that with Tableau, we will then take it to other software platforms as well, but that's outside the scope of the discussion of today. I'm going to hand you back over to Julia. Yeah, so <clears throat> we just um, talked you through what our, our plans are. We're right at the beginning of this, this project in many ways. So um, one of the things I would welcome 
through um, the network here today or through your extended network is um, the we have a, a little bit of a capacity issue at the CSU around uh, building of um, queries for primary care at the moment. So if you do know anyone who can write EMIS queries and would be willing to help us, funded, of course, paid, um, then please do get in touch. We'd be very grateful for um, any suggestions. Um, if you have general ideas, suggestions, um, you know, feedback, constructive feedback, then please, you know, do get in touch because, um, you know, we really want this, this, this program to, to work and make an impact. And if you're willing to be a beta tester, even better, please do get in touch. Um, and then um, for phase two, because we have quite tight timelines to deliver phase one, for phase two, there's a lot of functionality that we think, are oh, we'll put that into phase two just for timelines. And we do think it would be a great opportunity to engage the community in a hackathon, um, especially if we can all meet up again one day soon, um, which shouldn't be too long, hopefully. Um, and, um, you know, get your ideas. Um, we'll have um, sample data to, to be able to play with. Um, and to get your ideas and input. And, and obviously, you know, um, we'd be happy to sort of recognize that input. So um, yeah, if, if you're up for a hackathon, please do let us know and, and we'll get organizing. So yeah, so thanks for your time, everyone. And um, as there's our email addresses, please do get in touch if you've got any ideas or you'd like to help. So we'd, we'd uh, really appreciate that. So thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today. that was brilliant thank you it sounds like exciting stuff and then um, hopefully some people will reach out and get involved <laughs> great good luck with everything thank you for presenting today so um we're nearing the hour so um get uh everyone leaders back on i was gonna say the stage but it's not really a stage <laughs> um so uh, well, a big thank you uh, from me for all the presenters today. It's been fab. And also a thank you, as, as I mentioned earlier, this is my last healthcare tug as a leader. I might pop up now and again, though, because um, I'd like to see you all. But um, yeah, thank you. And thanks for having me. It's been a really great opportunity. And I was I messaged on Twitter to say how much I've kind of learned and, and the network that I've kind of gained from being part of this group has been phenomenal. I've met so many great people and learned so much from from the people that are here today and people that have been involved in the and come along to the healthcare groups over the last few years it's been it's such a great uh, network to be part of so thank you very much and good luck and I just wish all my co-leaders um all the best in the future and um I'll let them sign off thank you Ella I can't I think, I think it's definitely worth saying from everyone thank you Ella for your years of support mentoring provision of this uh, wonderful group so um i will give you a round of applause and i hope everyone else is joining me <laughs> in their muted way thank you <laughs> we're all emotional now oh. <laughs> thanks Ella. thanks for everything you've done you've been a real inspiration to us ah oh, thank you very much been an absolute pleasure um, gonna you, and i hope that uh, we continue to live on your legacy um and you're welcome back anytime obviously <laughs> i'll be i'll be jumping you from the sidelines and keeping an eye on you as well <laughs> cool right well thanks for everybody we'll be uh, getting the recording out soon and um and hopefully the uh, crew will get another one sorted out in the next few months oh and if anyone wants to speak reach out to chris emma and charlotte um we're always looking for speakers it's always a Bit of a challenge getting people to speak but please come along it's just about sharing ideas and stories and everything so it's a really good opportunity if you've got anything you'd like to share please reach out to these guys thank you right well i will close us off thanks guys thank you thanks, thanks everyone bye-bye bye now <laughs>